All right, turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 26 as we continue our journey through the Bible and Old Testament on Sunday nights. 1 Samuel chapter 26. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the way Scripture records the deeds of men and women. Um, not only do we see their successes, but we also see their failures and their lapses of faith and uh, from fear and unbelief. And it's helpful for us because I think it helps us to understand uh, where we're at, that these people are just the same as us. And um, we want to think that we always make the right decisions and choices, but too many times we uh, get to those points where, whether it's out of fear or pride or uh, we, we tend to freeze up or choke or we run on our emotions and make irrational decisions. Uh, and we can see that uh, even with those who, in Scripture, how they uh, ran on their emotions or they made bad decisions. Uh, but yet, as we all know, that God's not done with us. And uh, he uses those lapses of faith uh, to redirect us and to, to strengthen us. And uh, although, like we mentioned, there's the difference between the permissive will and the perfect will, he'll still use those permissive wills, the, our own decisions and choices, and he'll use what, those circumstances for his good and for his glory, you know, to get us back to where we need to be eventually. But as we see with David, he's really taken a walk of faith and confidence. Uh, we see his strength was probably helped him. Um, after what happened with Nabal, for those who haven't followed along, again, uh, that's why I always tell people to keep up uh, with what we're doing. Otherwise, you're going to have gaps in your understanding of Scripture or some of the things that we're going through. But what took place several chapters ago with Nabal, and uh, we watched how God strike Nabal, uh, who had a heart attack, and 10 days later he ends up dying. And this judgment was on Nabal's foolishness. And uh, God saved David uh, from taking matters into his own hands and taking revenge for himself. And uh, God had used Abigail, Nabal's wife, um, you know, to, to reason with David to implore him not to ruin his testimony for the future. And so David responded, and he trusted the Lord in this matter, and that he's going to take care of it. And then the, this ended with, uh, upon David, uh, uh, preparing David for the next challenge ahead of him. So one test will lead to another test, and it's just all preparation uh, to develop us, to grow us. And Saul, as we're going to see, he's going to try to make one more last attempt to apprehend David. Uh, and, and we're going to find David uh, standing strong in faith once again. And sometimes you wonder, why didn't God just summarize these chapters or First Samuel by saying, and David grew in maturity and faith, and he spent the years running from Saul. It would have been easy just to have that one line instead of all the details. Instead, we get these pages of details of David on the run and Saul trying to kill him and David refusing uh, to kill Saul when he had the chance and the opportunity multiple times. And we're going to see one more time tonight uh, in this particular story. So it's repeated. And the question at the moment is why give all these details? Well, for starters, that's the way life works, right? Uh, we, we don't have, you know... Uh, um, options sometimes you know it just there, there's uh, directions that the Lord has to take us down some uh, decisions that we got to go through and it's rare that we have some sort of trial that's uh, magically goes away in 24 hours sometimes it goes on for months and years not just overnight you know um, and, and just like David he spent years dealing with the trial of Saul uh, and so we have to sometimes sp uh, spend years dealing with um, the pain and suffering uh, in our lives, sometimes the consequences of sin and compromise. Uh, and the kind of problems that go away in a few moments, or a few days for that matter, doesn't draw us close to the Lord. It's the kind of problems that you know keep on going time and again that draws us close to the Lord to give us strength and maturity uh, in such situations. We don't like those times, but yet we wouldn't be where we're at today if we didn't go through those trying times. And that's one of the reasons why we read all these details of David's struggles, as an example. And again, keep in mind, you have to remember, God is preparing David to be king one day. So this is all preparation, what he has to go through. And perhaps in David's mind, he could have understood that. 
but I don't think he realized it until later on in life. Uh, how all these struggles and these tests in order to mature him, to develop him uh, for that greater trust in the Lord. And, and that's the application for us. It, it usually isn't until we get the hindsight that uh, we realize that all the things that we went through, it was worth it in the end. Um, and, and it matures us as believers. And sometimes those pains and struggles go on for years. And we wish that we can snap a finger and it's done. Um, but we have to remember that since God loves us, uh, he has a plan. He's got a purpose for our lives, and he wants to mature us and develop us and strengthen our trust in him. So with that in mind, let's dive into our study. Verse 20, chapter 26, verse 1. Now the Zeophites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hecala opposite of Jeshmon? Now, the last time we read of the uh, Ziphites was back in chapter 23, and uh, basically it's a community uh, that trusted in Saul, not in David. And they tattletailed on David, which caused Saul to go after David because they gave da uh, Saul the exact uh, point of where he was at hiding. So they said, okay, he, this is where he's hiding at. Saul, go, go after him. And now here again, we, we see oh, they're going to do the same thing. Uh, when the Ziphites disclosed uh, David's location back in 23... It inspired uh, Psalm 54. In fact, if you read Psalm 54, even the, uh, the title mentions Ziphites in there. And, and so we can see some wonderful psalms came out of these difficult times that uh, Saul was running, or David was running from Saul. And here the Ziphites are mentioned again, and there's no further reference after this point. Uh, we never read of God um, punishing them or turning, you know, for turning on David. And, uh, but here's the thing, God was behind the scenes, making it possible to get David on the move again. And we're, we're seeing the scene that's going to be set up for a big showdown between Saul and David into a specific location. And, and this is a key point to think about. If it wasn't for the Ziphites, though, tattletelling on David, uh, he and his men would have never moved to the location where God wanted him to be. The point is that it's often difficult or unpleasant things when they happen for us, but here's the thing, it's all for a purpose. We never know what God has in store for us through that situation. And I'm sure David hated the Ziphites for doing this and for telling on him, but it was all part of God's bigger plan, right? Verse 2 goes on to say, Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul encamped uh, the hill of Hecala, uh, which is opposite of Jeshmon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him in the wilderness. And David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. So here's Saul again on another campaign, another crusade to try to destroy David. And, and this is what happened. David fled into the wilderness, and Saul try, tries to chase after him. Now, David was a good soldier, and, and he knew the terrain. Uh, he was a shepherd, as you know, so he, he knew the ins and outs of the territory there, which made him more of an expert of the rain, area there. And he also had loyal men who were willing to die for him. And uh, Saul didn't know the terrain. And added to that, and his followers, uh, they weren't loyal like they were to David. So there's a difference there in who you're going to follow there. Uh, and so Saul certainly suspected them. Um, and on the occasion before us here with the Ziphites, evidently betrayed David to King Saul because they wanted to stay on the king's good side. Uh, and uh, perhaps he also knew that uh, if they're afraid of David, since they knew that David knew that they had previously betrayed him as well. So again, we're trying to side with Saul that he'll protect us because after all, we, we tattletailed, we betrayed David. And, and we saw at the end of the previous chapter that David had begun to compromise uh, with sin in his life by taking uh, two other wives, uh, Hiram, his wife, and, and then also taking Abigail, uh, the wife of uh, uh, wicked Nabal, who had died. And again, as we said, this was part of the permissive will. It's not the perfect will for David, but he ended up jumping into this situation. And so David has now placed himself in God's permissive will uh, as a result of these particular decisions. It wasn't best for him to do this, but yet God still allowed it to happen. 
and uh, we're not surprised that David encounters more testing and trials uh, from the hand of the Lord. But here we see, um, you know, th there is a, a word from these Ziphites concerning David's whereabouts, as King Saul previously uh, resolutes and the oaths that no longer search uh, and hunt for David uh, to kill him were aside by the king. And so King Saul was now relentlessly in hunting down David. Um, you know, again, his goal was to eliminate him. But yet King Saul also knows that David's going to be king one day. Now, in our lives as Christians, again, compromise with sin uh, will inevitably lead us down a path of discipline from the Lord. And um, it's a huge signal in the Lord's love for us that um, when we go astray in our hearts, that he begins to work in our past to make it difficult, to try to get us back on track. You know, So there's uh, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's other brothers and sisters, or there might be messages that we hear uh, or songs that we hear that just kind of get us back on track. And uh, living a life of compromise doesn't glorify the Lord, but it's also a fruitless and frustrating existence. You know, a backslidden Christian is the most miserable person because they know they're not doing what they're supposed to do, and they're guilty. Now, as you see with David, he's hiding out in the hill of Hecala, which is in the southern part of Judah, uh, which is kind of on the edge of the wilderness of Ziph. And uh, David, as we mentioned, he knew the terrain pretty well. Uh, and there was this large company uh, approaching. Uh, so he sent out spies to determine uh, who, who this is. In fact, it was Saul's group, the 3,000 men. And again, uh, Saul had little knowledge of this area uh, coming right into David's territory. Um, and uh, so he's the one that's actually in danger because he doesn't know what's you know the area and so king saul as we see he's so obsessed uh with trying to kill david again um but uh, he wasn't acting rationally uh and this time he's coming out into a region that's to try to hunt david verse 5 goes on to say so david arose and came to the place where saul had encamped and david saw the place where saul lay and abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army now saul laid within the camp with the people encamped all around him and then David answered and said Ahimelech the Hittite to Abishai the son of Zurah the brother of Joab saying who will go down with me to Saul's camp and Abishai said I will go down with you now if you think about how dangerous this was from um, David's perspective you have 3,000 men who were ordered to kill you and they could have seen David coming as a threat and killed him right on the spot, perhaps. And yet David decided, I'm going to go into their camp. I'm not going to have them come me. I'm going to go to them. And if David just wanted to send a messenger, he could have easily done that and sent a messenger and his life you know, wouldn't be a threat. But we also see here David is that leader you know, uh, that he, he goes in uh, with him uh, by himself, and he's asking, who else is going to come with me? Uh, and it's um, perhaps maybe you can be thinking of it this way, where David is coming to those terms, I'm sick of being on the run, I'm going to face Saul, you know, who's coming with me? You know, let's, let's rally the troops, right? And, and so the volunteer that goes with David is Abishai. We'll read more about him in, in uh, 2 Samuel. And again, David had a few generals within his army. Uh, the main uh, leader of the man uh, was Joab, and another general uh, was Joab's brother, Abishai. And so Joab is the more famous one that we read about uh, of the um, generals. He lived longer. Uh, Abishai is remembered as Joab's brother. And the only thing that we read of uh, Abishai here is his bravery and his willingness to go with David to face Saul. So verse 7 goes on to say, So David said to Abishai, Come to the people by night. And there Saul laid sleeping within the camp, and uh, his spear st uh, stuck in the ground by his head, and Abner and the people lay around him. And then Abishai said to David, Has God delivered your enemy into your hand this day? Now therefore, please, let me strike him at once with the spear right in the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. So everyone's sleeping. Abishai and David, they snuck into 
uh, Saul's camp. And this would make one of those great movie scenes. You know, imagine a quiet scene with lots of men snoring <laughs> and the, the sound of crickets in the background. <laughs> and here's David, one of his right hand men, probably whispered to David, Hey, David, look, God made it possible for us to sneak into the camp right to Saul. I can kill him um, with the thrust of my spear. I don't, I don't need any second effort, just one, one shot, and that's it. Come on, David, just give me the word. Uh, and in fact, David, you don't even have to say anything. Just let me go, and we'll end this thing right now. Now imagine how tired David and his men were running all these years at this point. It wasn't just a, a couple of days here and there. This is years on the run. And imagine how tempting this was for David himself to bring this to an end. And it could have happened in a moment. And after all, God did say that David's going to be king one day. And here's your opportunity. And this appears to be God's will to David to strike him down on the spot. He already had that opportunity a couple of chapters ago in the cave where he had an opportunity to kill Saul, but he didn't. And even here, David didn't even have to do the dirty work. He could have simply said nothing, and Abishai could have just killed him, right? And this leads us coming back to determine God's will for our lives based on circumstances. Just because a circumstance falls in our favor doesn't mean it's God's will for us. Okay, so we have to have that discernment. Uh, what does he want for us? David's right-hand man assumed it was God's will to kill because of the circumstances. But the important moral circumstance or uh, situation here uh, is that circumstances never comes before biblically-based values. Okay? So to kill Saul, no doubt, would have been a tremendous temptation, not only uh, to David and his men, but also David himself. Uh, and we tend to think of Satan's temptation as horrible things staring us in the face. Temptation usually involves something that is visually appealing or it appeals to our egos or to our pride. And if something were not appealing in the first place, it wouldn't be a temptation. Anyways, as we see, David and Abishai, they got to the spot where Saul was sleeping. And if you jump um, a couple more sentences to verse 12, we see that it says that they're all sleeping because what? The Lord had put them all in deep sleep. In fact, uh, from what I heard from one commentary, uh, that sleep, that deep sleep is the same one that, uh, that God caused Adam that deep sleep when he made Eve out of her. That's the deep sleep that is talking about here as well. So if God puts you to sleep, don't figure you're waking up no matter how loud the alarm clock is. And remember, the, the, the army surrounding the king. And there should have been guards awake protecting the camp. But God arranged it so that everyone was asleep that night. And it's the same God that allowed the Ziphites to tattletale on David's whereabouts. And so God arranges for everyone to sleep so that David can get right up to Saul again. The point is that God is working in the background in our lives. That's the thing. We don't understand it all, but yet he's working circumstances. He's working on you. He's working on the other circumstances. When God put Australia first on my heart, back in May 31st uh, of um, uh, 96, no, 98, 97, that's it, 97. It was eight years to the day that we left on a plane to come here. So God was working, preparing me and our family, but also allowing this situation here in Melbourne to be the right place for us to come in. I was striving for another place in, uh, in Australia, namely Sydney, and it would have been a disaster if we went there too soon or just going in there in general. That's not where God wanted us. He would have allowed it to happen. It would have probably been a disaster, but he waited for us to come here. This is where he called us to. And so it was eight years in the preparing uh, and the stages. And, and so God's working behind the scenes. Uh, little did I know all the other stuff taking place on this end, but God was working on me on the other end. So again, he's always working in the background of our lives. Now, we don't always understand the big picture, uh, the, the good things, the bad things that do happen to us, but often it's arranged or by the Lord. He allows things to happen for greater purposes. Verse 9 goes on to say, But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said furtherance, 
As for the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come and die, or he shall go out into battle and perish. And the Lord forbid that I should stretch up my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. And so David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head and they got away and no one saw or knew or awoke. For they were all asleep because the deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. So David could have let, as we mentioned, Abishai kill Saul, uh, and his hands would have been clean. Uh, but, but he didn't allow it. David didn't see it that way. Uh, he knew that the Lord was going to have to deal with Saul in the end, and that Saul would have to die because of uh, rebellion against the Lord, or he was in a battle, or some other way for, for the Lord uh, to kill Saul, and for him to die. And, um, but this didn't give uh, David the right to kill him and take matters into his own hands. And, uh, and I think for us, uh, it's hard to wait on the Lord uh, to act and, uh, uh, and, and, and revenge the wrong, uh, you know, that was done to us. Um, but, but that's the wrong attitude. We've got to let the Lord do what he needs to do instead of us taking matters into our own hands. Um, we shouldn't be waiting on the Lord to destroy someone, uh, but to restore that person for the, the wrongs they've done to us. Lord, just do a work in them. May they... You know, see the error of their ways. Um, you know, we should desire the Lord to save a life, not to destroy one. Even though you want to, Lord, just zap them, you know, and just do something to them. And I know that the wrongs I have done to you uh, may uh, be severe, uh, but, but think about what the Lord endured for all of us, though. I mean, that's kind of our, the, the level that we got to continue to think about, that he was nailed to the cross, and he took the, uh, the place by those around him. He was able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, um, you know, may, may we have the same compassion and love for people uh, to see them restored and not destroyed. You know, that, that's, that's the heart of God. You know, yet we want to take matters into our own hands. And so as God's working, and David must have recognized this because he took Saul's spear and the jug of water as evidence that he could have killed Saul. Much like the other chapter where he could just cut the edge of his robe, which is probably uh, part of the rankings of him that he might have had there. This opportunity to kill King Saul must have been a great temptation, again, for David. Uh, David knew that the king was, uh, were, were dead men, and, and many of his difficulties uh, would be removed if he did this. And so the king uh, daily uh, vexed the soul of David, keeping him uh, from being able to um, settle peacefully in one place and enjoy the community of worship of God's people. Um, David was still on the run, yet he wanted to calm down. He wanted to, you know, worship the Lord in many sleepless nights because he was fretting and worrying about King Saul hunting for him. He's, he's you know, that's always on your mind. And so David must have been tempted to think that since the Lord had begun to open the door, uh, that David was able to kill King Saul, surely this must be his plan. But the Lord clearly revealed that David, uh, the evil taking personal revenge after uh, our previous study, which Abigail interceded and kept him from killing wicked Nabal, who had defrauded and disrespected David. And so David's um, third testing here uh, by the Lord, we see that he would uh, take his own personal revenge. And so we need to understand that just because the doors open does not mean that we necessarily walk through it. Okay? Anyways, Abishai is convinced that uh, this is the Lord's plan uh, and for the, the king to be put to death. So that's his idea, what he wants to do. And so David here is now restraining Abishai from committing this act in the same way that he was restrained by Abigail, as we saw in the previous chapter. And... Uh, and um, those opportunities that uh, waiting for David uh, to get even. And uh, although one may not respect Saul as a man, but nevertheless, as David said, that he was the Lord's anointed. It's the office that he uh, uh, 
um, uh, respected. And it would be wrong to kill uh, God's king. And the Lord himself would strike the king one day, or, or he's just going to die, and perhaps one day uh, the king will die in battle. And so David believed that God would uh, take him to the throne. Let God do it. Let God um, place you there, not you forcing yourself there. And uh, it would be wrong for David to stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed. Uh, the last part of verse 11, David's telling uh, to take the, the jug of water and the, um, the spear. And uh, the reasons for that will be clear in the next set of verses. Um, but, but I don't think that David was really intending to kill Saul. I think he was intending to do this very thing, to get close to Saul uh, and, and take some of his stuff to show Saul that he has no intentions in killing him, to try to you know, calm the situation down. This time, uh, David doesn't seem tempted to harm Saul. Uh, he knows right off the bat he needs to be kind to Saul. And again, as Paul writes, don't overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. It's so hard to do. But this is one of those cases and points. And, and this is where David's growing in maturity, in character. Uh, Peter writes in uh, first or Second Peter 3.18, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. That's how we all need to grow in maturity. And I think at times that we can reach these plateaus where we think that we can't grow any further uh, from where we are. And then God takes us around the corner and in our lives and we see this big, huge mountain, you know, and, and that's still yet to be climbed, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a road and it's not going to end until we're in glory, you know. There's going to be, I, I picture it as a like a cross-country race where you're going through the hills and the mountains and going through puddles of water and jumping over obstacles and you're running through the mountain through the ups and downs that's the way i picture the christian life and um and, and so we all have much further to go uh, we'll never arrive we got to keep pressing on verse 13 goes on to say now david went over to the other side and stood on the top of the hill afar off and a great distance from between them and david called out to the people who abner and the son of Ner, saying do not answer abner and then abner called and says who are you uh, calling out to the king so da david said to abner are you not a man so that was the question then are you not a man the question today is what's a woman right <laughs> just kidding so David said to Abner, Are you not a man, and who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your lord, the king. And this thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you shall deserve to die, because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the jug of water that was by his head. So why is David now taunting Abner, saying that he must not be a man because he was sleeping uh, when he was supposed to be awake protecting the king. And I think David wanted Abner to know that uh, Saul could have been killed once again, uh, but he wasn't. He had this opportunity. And thus David is saying that he cares more for Saul than Abner does. And since he was sleeping on the job because that was deserving of the death penalty. So David uh, isn't um, not taunted by Abner's response, but he proceeds to taunt and, and indict Abner for neglecting his duty and protecting the king. And so David is basically telling Abner that the rest of Saul's army, they're all worthy to die, literally sons of death, because of their, uh, you know, they, they didn't fulfill their responsibilities in protecting the king. So after David... Um, taunts and, and indicts uh, Abner. King Saul perks up and he responds to David similarly that he did in the previous incident uh, when David spares the life there. So verse 17 goes on, then Saul said, so, no, Saul knew David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son David? And David said, it is my voice, my lord, O king. And he says, why does my lord thus pursue his servants? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please, let my lord, the king, hear the words of his servants. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. So now, 
Do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the, the, the king of Israel has come to seek as a flea, as one who hunts a par partridge in the mountains. So again, once again, we see Saul speaks to David like a broken man, like he has repented. You know, son, I'm sorry, please forgive me. As you can hear the cry in his voice here um, type thing, yet his heart, again, hasn't changed. Um, he got caught, and he, he's trying to make himself look good. Um, and if there was true repentance here, then there would have been a change in his behavior. But as we'll see, there is none. True repentance requires that change of heart and mind and actions. And uh, so Saul knew and he understood that he did wrong, uh, but he didn't repent of his sins. Uh, he didn't come to God and ask for God's forgiveness for his sins. Uh, why would God forgive him if he had come to uh, God with a contrite uh, and broken heart? Would he? Of course he would, but he didn't. And again, as we read in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Saul could have experienced that if he really had that heart there. A repentance is more than just a confession of sin, but it's a requirement of turning away from it. And how many times have we already seen so far that Saul claimed that he had sinned against God? You know, but truly he didn't turn uh, away from any one of the, the things that he's done. But God knows exactly what we're thinking and what's in our hearts. And so we might be able to pe fool people around us, uh, but our theatrical repentance, uh, which is nothing more than a remorse for being sorry that we got caught. Uh, but God sees through uh, with his infinite wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now David, on the other hand, speaks from his heart and is reflected in his actions. He's going to appeal to uh, Saul that he has done nothing wrong, and he wants to come back home uh, and worship in the tabernacle instead of being on the run and forced into other lands where they worship other gods. What, you know, what bothered David so much was that he was in exile, he was in wandering, uh, and he wasn't able to serve the Lord uh, in, in the community of God's people. Uh, he wasn't even able to make a sacrifice for his sins because this was a, a pattern of what he did before. Now he's in a place that he can't do that. And we see this reflected in Psalm uh, 42. You can see his heart in that if you want to read that at another time. And it's important to understand that David is saying, in a sense, look, I've been on the run. I can't take this anymore. I'm on the verge of moving out of Israel into being in a, a land of pagan gods. You know, I, I can't be a fugitive anymore. I want to come home. I want to worship the Lord. And that temptation uh, did overcome David, as we'll see in chapter 27. And perhaps that's what inspired David to make the speech in the first place. Uh, sometimes when our back is against the wall, and we've had it, is when we we're kind of had the, the most boldness uh, in our lives, in our situation. And it could be David said, I, I can't uh, take being on the run another day. It's time for me to face Saul and to tell him I'm not going to kill him. Uh, if I get killed in the process, so be it. So he's kind of surrendered to that situation. And I found that oftentimes that God uh, gets us to a point where he wants us after we've exhausted all other options. And, and that's where we come to the place of surrender. You know, and, uh, you know, there, there's nothing else we can do but just to leave it in your hands, Lord. You know, and that's where it should have been in the first place. And, uh, and this is often where God's saying, great, I've been waiting for you to say this and to surrender it all into my hands. In such situations, uh, God gets 100% of the credit because there's no other options. You know, that's where he does the, the miraculous work. The trick is learning to surrender our will to God before having uh, to sink to the bottom level. You know, uh, the, the quicker that we do it, the better off we are. But sometimes we sometimes hit rock bottom in our situations. <coughs> as we see here with David, he sees himself as insignificant. As he says to Saul that you're coming after like a flea. As you know, a flea is kind of an insignificant little insect. You know, why, you, why bother? You know, I'm nothing. And as David saying, you're wasting your time, the time of the army trying to catch me. Not only am I not guilty of treason, but it's a waste of your resources. You know, just there's no need to do this. And a partridge is a bird that walks a lot more than it flies. 
And you can kill a partridge just by chasing it around uh, a few times and then you whack it over the head with a stick, you know. And, that, and so this is basically just, it's just foolishness. And, and it's in this manner that Saul has hunted David, uh, coming hastily upon him, putting him uh, up from time to time uh, in hopes that he should at length and, and by frequent repetitions of it be able to destroy him. And so the, the point here is David says he's had it, he's tired, like a tired partridge uh, that can't fly anymore in the sense that David's had it to that point. And so David leaves the matter in the Lord's hands, and uh, if he lives or if he dies, you know, God, your will is going to be done. Verse 21, then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life is precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. So, again, we see its words here, but did Saul really repent? I don't believe he did. His actions uh, shows that he didn't. Uh, they're empty uh, words spoken because he was caught doing something he shouldn't be doing. He shouldn't be chasing after David in the end. And uh, we're going to see shortly that, uh, that King Saul is going to be killed and his tombstone could easily be read, you know, I have sinned, I've played the fool, I've erred exceedingly. And so Saul tried to grab uh, his greatest uh, uh, from the men. Uh, and in doing so, he lost it, not only before his fellow man, but also before the Lord. God could have made Saul a great king. Uh, he equipped him for uh, the work, but Saul failed to do the work. He failed to surrender his life to the Lord. And how many people do they come to the end of their life and they appear before the Lord and will repeat the same words of Saul? You know, I've sinned, I've played the fool, I've erred exceedingly. Don't waste your life, you know, serve it, surrender to the Lord. Verse 22, and David answered and says, here's the king's spear. Let uh, one of the young men come over and get it. And may the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord deliver you to my hand today. And I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in the eyes, uh, my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord. Let him be uh, delivered out of all tribulation. Righteousness, as you know, is a gift from the Lord. You know, it's not our righteousness, it's the Lord's righteousness that's imputed on our half because of Christ. And it means a person has a right standing with the Lord. So David recognized that his power, his strength, his righteousness and faithfulness are the Lord's. And that's the same for us. Uh, it is the Lord who delivered Saul uh, into the hands of David. And in the end, it is the Lord who is the judge. He is the one that uh, brings down one and lifts up another. You know, blessed be his name. Uh, and so David, uh, he's not going to lift his hand against Saul uh, in, dis in, in respect for the office the Lord had anointed him. Uh, David had tremendous respect for the Lord. And as we see here, David was trusting the fact that the Lord would treat him as um, he had treated Saul. As we mentioned in last week's message in Luke chapter 6 and uh, verse 31, just as you want people to treat you, treat them in the same way. You know, forgive, you know, uh, judge not, uh, etc. Give and it will be given to you. The golden rule, uh, that it's a spiritual law. So uh, let us do to others as we want them to do to us, right? Verse 25, then Saul said to David, my, uh, may you be blessed, my son David, and you shall do both uh, great things uh, and also prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. So as we see here, Saul uh, recognized the, the success of David's future as king of Israel. Um, and, and it's interesting that even though Saul uh, says all these wonderful things, uh, that the spirit within David would not allow him uh, to, to place himself in the hands of Saul. Sounds tempting. Hey, let's just go off, you know, you know, together. Uh, Saul does, in a sense, speak blessing on David, um, but he doesn't keep his word, however. Uh, Saul is totally consumed by an evil spirit, and his heart would desire to, to rid David so that uh, his family would remain king. That's the ultimate goal of Saul. Now, how come David doesn't take that invitation to return? with him because he didn't believe Saul you know that he had that discernment you know um, you know let's wait and see how this thing really works out you know instead of just jumping on it you said you're sorry okay let's go I'm gonna put all my trust in you you know 
So David's last exchange of words between um, them, and as we're going to see in a few more chapters, that uh, Saul's going to die in battle. Uh, so David didn't have to do anything. So David went his way. He didn't go back to the palace with Saul. David saying, I don't trust Saul. And thus Saul heads home, and David remained on the, uh, in the wilderness. Verse 20, chapter 27, verse 1, David said in his heart, Now I shall perish some day in the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me that I should speedily escape into the hand of the Philistines, and Saul uh, will despair me to seek me any more in the part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. So as we see here, David, uh, on the run for Saul for all these years, has taken a toll on his life, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, etc. He's drained, so discouraged, he feels that one day Saul's still going to kill him. And thus the only solution is to flee into the enemy, uh, into the land of the Philistines, at least that way he would be safer there. How could David feel this way? Well, it's the same way we do. When we take our eyes off the Lord, we focus on our situation, we become discouraged and in despair, Just and you feel hopeless. That's where David's still at. And keep in mind, it wasn't that Saul drove him uh, into the land of the Philistines. It was discouragement and despair, that, uh, and, and that always leads us into the hand of the enemy, away from the Lord. Don't give in to that. And that's... Uh, Easier said than done, but that's what always happens when we give in to uh, discouragement and despair. And so notice that uh, what's going on in David's heart. He didn't say these things out loud. Uh, these are the things that were eating at him. Uh, it was going on inside him. It was manifesting outwardly, though. So these are things that he was wrestling with for a period of time. And I like how one writer said, if someone says in their heart, uh, God doesn't care about me, it will make a difference in their life. If someone says in their heart, I deserve better than this, it will make a difference in their life. If someone says in their heart, I come before others, it will make a difference in their heart. By the same principle, if someone says in their heart, God loves me and I don't have to earn his love, it will make a difference in their life. If someone says in their heart, I'm grateful for every blessing I have, it will make a difference in their life. If someone says says others come first it will make a difference in their life if we say in our hearts uh, that has great power for good or evil blessing or cursing so those are the things that matter so if we believe that god is good that he is loving you know it changes our attitudes you know and uh, but th th this is so true don't give up put your trust in the lord because he will uh, you're not going to find peace outside of him you know, uh, and, and we're going to have our protection in the Lord. Uh, what an important lesson for us to learn. Verse 2, Then David arose and went over to the 600 men who were with him, and Achish, the son of Mach, uh, in the king of Gath. So David went, uh, dwelt in Achish of Gath, and he and his men in each of the household, David and his two wives, Hinnom, the Jezreelite, Abigail, the Carmelitess, uh, Nabal's widow, and so it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. So we tend to think that things are going well. Uh, and when the enemy leaves us alone, uh, you know, we're doing well. But in reality, the opposite, you know. Um, when the heat is turned up, the enemy's trying to stop us uh, from the work that we're doing for the Lord. So there's always going to be this spiritual battle that we're facing. And you think about David. Saul leaves him alone, but he's in the camp of the enemy outside the land of Israel. And so David's not alone. He brings his family. He brings his men with him. And in our backsliding, uh, in our sin, uh, it does affect those around us and not in a good way. And this is what is going to happen. So he's bringing all these other people downward with him. David's faith now begins to fail as he doubts God's promises uh, to him and begins to think that one day Saul's still going to kill him. And remember, the Lord had already told David that he will be the next king. So that is a promise from the Lord over and over. That has been confirmed. So what happened in inquiring of the Lord? Because we saw multiple times David inquired of the Lord. He prayed. He inquired of the Lord. And remember for a while, David inquired uh, of the Lord before he acted. And now uh, he was cycling in this unbelief. Uh, he doesn't inquire of the Lord, but rather chooses to take matters into his own hands. He's running on his emotions. And one person has uh, defined living by faith as living without scheming. You're not striving. You know, you're just trusting the Lord. 
And, and, and we see in this chapter, David again is resorted to scheming out for himself to try to get out of troubles and get out of difficulties. He's determined to remove himself from Israel where King Saul would hunt him and go live amongst the Philistines. Not a good place to go. And so we can understand David's dilemma at this juncture. He was under this increasingly anxiety over his circumstances. He's letting it get to him. And the trial he faced as a result of King Saul hunting him like an animal trying to continue to chase after him like an animal continuously. Um, And it's been estimated that the, the men and women... The women with children, the wives, the David, and this band of men can now easily be close to 2,500 people. So from the 600, you have all the wives, you have all the children, uh, the whole family, everyone's with them. So, so it's a much bigger a gang now. And it must have seemed like there's no way that David can continue to hide from the soul with this big, large entourage. And it must have seemed like an impossible task you know, to provide the food for them, uh, to provide water and shelter for such a large group of people. So now it's getting worse, right? So he just had the, the men before, and he was trying to provide for them. Now it's doubled. And... Um, David and his wives and perhaps some of the children were so concerned it wore heavily upon them. And David most likely began to think that due to the length of time in the trial with King Saul chasing after him, there's no light at the end of the tunnel uh, for himself and that he'll never get out of this alive. And one of the things that we need as Christians to realize that all of our trials in our lives Um, It it only lasts for a while. It's only for a period of time. It doesn't continue on uh, every single day for the rest of our lives. Uh, As far as our relationship with Christ is concerned, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we kind of go through seasons and cycles of difficulties and, and suffering. And again, as the, the scripture gives the promise concerning this truth in 1 Peter 5.10, After you have suffered a while, the Lord of all, God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect comfort or confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So those are the things that happen when we go through the trials. And little did David know that this period of wanderings uh, would soon uh, end uh, when King Saul and and his son Jonathan, uh, David's best friend, are killed in battle. Uh, So David could have just hung in there by faith. Just keep trusting the Lord for him to protect you. But here we're going to see David took matters into his own hands. And um, Sometimes we face the temptation to take a shortcut to try to end our trials or to accomplish the goals or the calling that God has for us. But there's no shortcuts in God's kingdom. You know, it, you're only shortcutting your maturity, your development process. And so David wanted every fiber in his being to take a shortcut becoming king. And so we see this wasn't God's plan for him. Um, Verse 5 continues, And then David said to Achish, Now I have found favor in your eyes. I let them give me in the place in some, some town in the country that I have dwelled there. For why should your servant dwell in a royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziglag that day, and therefore Ziglag belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up from the raid of Gershites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. For those nations that were inhabited in the land uh, from old, that you go to Shur, uh, even as far as the land of Egypt. Now, the last time Achish kicked David out of this, um, but this time we see that the men are with him, and uh, they thought David would be benefiting. He gives David even a broader town of Ziglag, um, which is located between the foothills between the, um, the Philistine and the Semonite territory, according to Joshua 19. And thus they were no longer on the run. And and they had the city to dwell in, a fortified city. And yet when you're outside of the will of God, you're never safe. You can be in the most dangerous place in the world and obey the Lord, and it's still the safest place when you're in His will. You see, that's where faith is. That's where trust comes in. Uh, Are we willing to submit to Him or or walk, you know, by faith, not by sight? Verse 9 goes on to say, Whenever men attacked, David attacked the lamb. He left neither man or woman alive, but took away the sheep and the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, uh, the apparel, uh, returned and came home to Achish. So David understands he is living where he shouldn't be living, 
and thus he believes trying to justify by attacking the enemies of Israel and in doing so he not only kills the people but he also robs them and because there's no one left alive no one can tell Achish uh, what David was doing, um, but that's not going to stop Achish from asking David what he's been up to. Let's see how the situation plays out. Verse 10. And then Achish said, What have you been made uh, a, a raid today? And David would say, Against the south area of Judah, against the south area of the Jehemalites, and against the south area of the Kenites. And David would save neither man or woman alive. And to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform us, and saying, thus David did. And thus it was his behavior all the time to dwell in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed the Lord, believed David, saying he has made his people uh, Israel utterly abhor him, and therefore he will be my servant forever. So Achish is asking David, what have you been up to? David lies to him uh, and tells him that he's been invading uh, the land of Israel. And thus it, Achish thinks that he's uh, a friend since David now has been burning his bridges that you might say with his people. But David's not alone in this. His sin of lying and his sin of murder uh, is going to raise its ugly head. And that's the thing. The root of sin, if it's not dealt with, will come back, and it'll come back even stronger. That's why we got to get to the root of that sin, whatever that problem is, deal with it. You know, so David, he's not in a good situation because of his lies. He's not going to, um, you know, it's not going to get him into trouble because he's killed everyone. So they're not going to come back on him. David made sure that every man, every woman, and child were killed in his raid so that no one would be able to tell the king uh, who David, who, who he really attacked. And so they, they just made more um, the, the situation more complicated for David. Later on, this is going to come back and bite David because David, uh, when he started to reign on the throne, he wanted to build the temple, as you remember. Uh, to the Lord. However, the Lord rejected him uh, being able to do so because he was a man of bloodshed. Coming back to this situation, that's why he couldn't do it. So that's why Solomon had to build the temple. And I believe the result of the consequence for David going off these raids, killing all these men and women and children in order to cover his tracks before the king of Gath. So Achash brought David the story of the battles involving the conquering the people of Judah and taking their, their livestock was pleasing in Achash's sight. Uh, it would mean that David would be more and more detestable in Israel and also King Saul's sight. So that would kind of go in their favor. But as we close, I just want to encourage you uh, today um, not to be afraid or despise the difficulties or the trials or the pains that we go through. Uh, doesn't mean we're going to jump up and down, but again, as James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You know, God has a plan and a purpose for everything that we go through. Uh, don't think of uh, trying to take a shortcut uh, to end these trials or take a shortcut to uh, the, the plans and the calling uh, that the Lord has for your life. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that we are promised that every single trial that we go through is designed for our good and the end result of our trials is something that is precious to us that's going to produce in us that peace, um, that, that righteousness, that uh, it's the character of the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these lessons in this uh, chapters. And I pray that we would uh, take to heart uh, what you're telling us individually. Uh, we desire to do your will. We want to serve you. Uh, give us the discernment that we need and the wisdom that we need as we go through life. Uh, just as uh, your, your will for us at any given moment. Uh, for the big decisions that we need to make, we ask to either give us the, the wisdom for it, the provision for it, whatever is needed, and that you either bless it or that you would block it. And then uh, as we trust you, that you were, you're going to guide us, that you're going to lead us to um, what you want us to do. Uh, keep us close to you uh, through your word, through, through, uh, through prayer, through accountability to other Christians as well. That we can't do this uh, 
walk on our own, that we not only need you and your word, but we need each other. Uh, give us the boldness that we need to take a stand for you and to be a great witness for you uh, in, in the lives of others. And I pray that you fill us with your spirit, um, that you continue to mold us to be the men and women you've called us to be. For all the pains and the hurts that we've all gone through, every single one of us has gone through something or is going through something, uh, we ask for just uh, your hand upon uh, our lives, upon the situation. We ask for healing, uh, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, uh, spiritual, whatever it is, Lord, uh, nothing's too hard for you. And uh, what you can do in a moment may take a lifetime to empty. And so we surrender all to you. We thank you for your, your word. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.